This is Chris Morrow, Comic-Con at Home, and I am remotely connected at the Tin Fish in San Diego. And the panel is Making a Living, Being Creative. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Please introduce yourself and tell us where your home is. Ladies. Uh, I'm AC Bradley. I'm the EP of Marvel's What If, and I live in Altadena, California, just north of Los Angeles. Um, I am Jess Cuff. I uh, was a storyboard artist over at Marvel Animation and currently working at Warner Brothers on Gremlins Secrets of the Mogwai. And uh, I am in Sherman Oaks, California. And I'm Lee Cozy. I'm a freelance artist uh, working for a lot of companies, but most people know me from my work on um, Star Wars, uh, doing art for like a lot of the Disney art galleries and stuff. And then I do a lot of uh, pre-visualization or pre-pitch art for producers and writers who are trying to actually pitch their projects in Hollywood. Well, welcome. Please tell me about the panel. How did it go? Uh, I think it went pretty good. <laughs> uh, it was, it was, it was fun. Of, yeah, <laughs> it was a ton of fun. It was really great being able to just very kind of casually talk about the industry and being in it, getting different perspectives and stuff. Learned a lot from TDs too, especially about like different perspectives outside of visual, like outside of where I am visually creative, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. I was recording at an Airbnb in Idlewind. <laughs> so <laughs> I have never done a panel from a stranger's living room. Uh, <laughs> I felt bad. So I think my audio and my video kept cutting in and out because I was in the mountains, but it was a lot of fun. Mainly, I mean, anytime you do a panel, like the biggest perk to me is meeting the other panelists and just learning more about their side of the industry and how we all basically work together. Yeah. A virtual fist bump. <laughs> all right. <Doop. laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I had a blast. Um, uh, I'm actually, I should have, I forgot to mention, I'm actually down south uh, of LA. I'm in San Diego, California. Mm -hmm. um, but uh but yeah, it, the, the panel I thought was a lot of fun. I, and one of the things that I do is um, when I do these panels, I try to rotate the, the people who are on them and also uh, not just the creative people who are on them, but I also try to rotate what jobs there are. So we've had like voice actors and directors and stuff like that in rich, regularly. And we do that for exactly what Jess was talking about is to try and get different perspectives so that every time somebody goes and sees the panel, they get new information. They don't just hear the same three people talking all the time about their careers. Yeah. Did you find that the Comic-Con at home was more effective than at the convention center? Um, because I guess it's the year of the freshman, right? Because it's free to everyone. It's going to be, you can watch it over and over again. Um, the type of people they can be for be young and old, right? Yeah. Uh, I kind of think that, um, I mean, Definitely am not one to say, you know, until all of this you know, cr craziness is over, like don't want people make putting themselves in a position where they could get sick, make other people sick. Like that's 100% what we all don't need. But uh, I do miss being able to be like in person, seeing the panels. I miss like the, the excitement that you get from the room when something new is shown or somebody on the panel makes a joke and everybody laughs. And like, it's, it's just fun to be in the room together. But being able to have these streaming panels for everybody to see, I think is a, a, a kind of a leg up. It's been a case of like, you've got like maybe a bootleg, somebody kind of bootleg camera mm -hmm. films the panel that you were hoping to see, but you didn't get the chance. Like being able to view it later, I think would be a great benefit to a lot of people that weren't able to come to Comic-Con, financial situations, couldn't travel, all kinds of things, but at least they get the same, like uh, uh, what Lee was talking about, the kind of information that you can get at these events, you know? And I like that, uh, uh, I think, well, one of the things that we, cause we've been doing a live watch party on my channel on Twitch um, pretty much since Wednesday night. So we've been playing, I have got, dozens and dozens of panels pretty much every 45 minutes every hour there's another panel playing um and i mean we've been doing like 10 and 12 hour streams so of just you know non-stop uh panels but one thing we have noticed is that uh it would be really cool to have a laugh track because that lack of an audience 
actually reacting yeah. to some of the stuff they say. It's kind of like, you know, because some of the, the writer guys are just kind of like, yeah, they're very low key, very chill. But then you have the artists, you know, and we're used to, uh, and this is something Jess and I covered in the panel is we're used to when we're drawing, you know, we're like, pew, pew, you know, we're sitting there making yes. noises and it's all like, <laughs> oh, get you, my little pretties. You know, we're sitting there making noises and acting dorky and it's like, you know, it's like, your soul is mine. Yeah. And we're, we're just making stuff up as we go. So we tend to be very kind of animated and all over the place. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of the writers are like, yeah, I was writing this epic about the, you know, virtuosity of humanity. And it was just, oh it was kind of, so it's kind of like, it's like, they're great informative panels, but my God, audience <laughs> participation would certainly liven that yeah. up. Yeah. Um, but overall, uh, I love it. I hope it's something they actually carry through uh, in in future panels where or you know, future conventions where they'll actually record it live and then post it to YouTube. That way people who can't, you know, because Hall H, if anybody's ever been to Comic-Con, Hall H line is sometimes days long. Uh, yeah. Not a joke. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's tents and stuff outside to cover people with the thousands of people trying to get in there. So I like the idea that if they videotape it, they can just, you know, uh, upload it to YouTube after the fact or even broadcast it live or something. But, you know, whatever they do, just to try and make sure that it's archived somewhere so that the people yeah. who got stuck outside and couldn't watch it can still catch it. And it'll have the audience laugh track. I just want to add that I was first in line at Hall H this year. Ah. I have picture <laughs> proof. <laughs> well done. Well done. Also, Perfect. there is something magical about Hall H, like being in there with like 8,000 other people, the mm -hmm. adrenaline, the energy. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping we're back to that next year and we get to be able to come. It's because it's something special about just fans and artists from across the country and the world coming together and just, I mean, I've had some of my best conversations about the business just sitting in like a lobby of a hotel mm -hmm. trying to cool off for 10 minutes and it could be with a father who brought his three kids to see this to a fellow writer and I miss the community but right now the most important thing is everyone stays safe yeah very much agree now let's talk about the pandemic and do you find creativity flows better for you staying at home or is it harder for you I find it hard. Um, <laughs> I miss, you don't realize as a writer how much of your ideas just come from your social interactions with people. Um, I miss even when I'm like blocked walking down the hallway to the edit bays. I miss hanging out with the storyboard artists and coming up with ideas. I miss going out with my friends and like just talking about our lives that aren't pandemic related. Mm -hmm. Right now, most of our conversations circle around that. But Again, I think we're all just, we're kind of wearing masks and doing what we can and staying socially distant and Zooming mm -hmm. and just hoping that by July, 2021, we're back together. Yeah, we, uh, um, I've been doing the same thing when it comes to like, especially since so many of my friends are also fellow coworkers, like fellow creatives as well. Um, uh, we've been to kind of supplement us not being able to be together physically. Like we even had a friend's birthday over Zoom. We did like the Jackbox thing where everybody played on their phones and like it was, it, it's been finding ways around, uh, not being able to be there physically, but that is something you miss. I'm lucky enough to be able to uh, be living with my fiance um, and we've been quarantining together. And so thankfully I can have another person to like bounce ideas off of. I mean, he's my best friend. Like uh, uh, we are able to talk all the time, but you know, I have a lot and of he's friends he's also that... creative too, right? Like he yeah, works in the uh, industry? Okay. Uh, my fiance actually works in visual effects, especially for uh, commercials and stuff. Um, he uh, got the chance to work on the music video Humble with the, um, uh, for Kendrick Lamar with the studio Timber. Um, and so he also has like a different perspective when talking about even looking at my work, like I can have somebody here in the house to come mm -hmm. and comment on like personal stuff me going through it uh, uh developing prints or like my own art book or my own film ideas or however um uh and being able to work through zoom talking with my directors them being so open with uh getting notes and things like that um but there's there's as humans 
there is definitely something different about not being a not having the sensory information that you're used to interacting with other people you know how the room smells what somebody looks like what they sound like being able to hug somebody like all those things kind of make up our interactions and it is something that i miss because it's very frequent in the studio setting but it's way more necessary for us to stay safe for us to make sure that we can all come back eventually you know yeah and it's also the the you know going to bars or going to you know like one of the things i used to love doing was <clears throat> go to a uh, coffee shop uh, you know, once or twice a week with a bunch of my friends sometimes. And so we would just hang out and draw and write and do creative stuff. But there would sometimes be somebody would meander in who's just this over the top personality and the way they interact or the way that they, you know, just basically capture the room either in a good way or a bad way or something. And then, you know, the next thing you know, like another, you're working on a project the next day and suddenly you find that person is now a character in your project. And it's just, so it's like, you, I, I didn't realize, you know, to me, I didn't realize how much, I don't want to say it was dependent on that, but definitely how much it influenced some of the projects I work on. Because, you know, again, as a visual artist, I'm more into like the physicality and the mannerisms and stuff like that and how that character bears themselves and their posture and, you know, their body language. But, you know, it's, it's fun, you know, uh, being able to incorporate that. And of course, now that I don't have that, I find that I'm actually watching a lot more movies. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and, then, and then I somewhat find that a lot of my characters, it's like, oh, that's too much like this guy. Well, okay, I got to start throwing these in. So now they're, now what would have been some dude from a coffee shop or a 7-Eleven or something, some weird random social interaction is now a collection of just, you know, I'm going to grab Michael Douglas from this movie and I'm going to grab someone from this movie and they're going to look like uh, Dom DeLuise in drag as a black woman. So, you know, and, so true. Oh. So true. Yeah. 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 Oh. So let's let's talk about making a living being creative. How does someone actually find work as as a freelance being creative, or just find work if they're not? You know, there's so many people that are unemployed right now. Can they actually find something being creative? I would say so. I mean, there's uh, uh, there's an availability for you to be able to get into the industry. The issue that a lot of people run into uh, because it's a, and I subscribe to this theory it's like 50% talent and it's also 50% luck like and it's not it really isn't random luck it's not like the universe suddenly hits you out of nowhere and then you get a job it's not really it's you making sure to be in the right place at the right time and also being open to possibilities mm -hmm. like uh um and got a chance to say this on the panel that my job at marvel at marvel animation i got because i was willing to work a special art show for my college that i was working for and then happened to meet my bosses there and through circumstances and me being willing to just kind of go with it got the chance to finally break it down and they said hey we would love for you to come down and come talk to us we've seen your stuff we like how uh, you are as a person. We'd like to talk to you more. It's those kinds of instances that are very important for you to be able to recognize. It's hard to have those, especially in this environment that we're in right now, but that makes it all the more important to be open and kind of be aware, be observant, especially as a visual artist. The biggest part of our job is to make sure to be observant. So you have to have yourself open to that as well as develop work that heavily exemplifies who you are like what you want to bring to the table because they your boss's job is to tell you what to draw your job coming into it is showing how you draw that's what somebody wants to know i was waiting for ac <laughs> oh i was gonna say like the only thing i can think is i mean when it comes to when it comes to writing i mean the lucky thing about writing is that all you need is a pen and pencil or basic software and just keep writing right now. I mean, it is a weird time in the industry. Um, I entered the industry during the writer's strike back in 08. Like, I had just finished film school and suddenly everything was shut down. But, you know, I wrote a pilot and then a year later I sold that pilot. Like you just kind of show up at your kitchen table and you take all the emotions you're feeling and 
you try and find a story. Because the thing is, if you write about what's going on in your life, odds are it's going to resonate with someone else. Um, and I think the hope is that the business will start, it did crunch right now, it did shrink because production's not happening, uh, live action production. But the second we get a chance, I think everyone's going to be expanding and bursting and hiring left and right to make up for lost time. Yeah, and also right now, because so much of uh, like on-site production and stuff is shut down. A lot of people, they're, uh, even if you don't have the clients to find, a lot of people have that spare time. So instead of, you know, sitting down, you know, as much as I love movies and sitting down and watching, you know, get a box of popcorn and, you know, a bucket of popcorn and just watch a movie, instead of doing that or instead of playing video games or something, uh, sit down at your art table, sit down at your writing table or whatever, compose something, draw something, write something, start building something that's your own. Um, I've seen a lot of creatives are actually starting to do stuff and myself included where we're just like, you know what, I'm going to finish this. Hopefully I'll get it done in a couple of months and I can put it on Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And so it'll give you something that even if you don't have uh, a client for this project, kind of like how AC did is she created her pilot because there was nothing else to do at the time because nobody was hiring writers during the strike. So at least not legally. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, nobody was hiring at the time that she entered the industry. So she wrote a pilot. And then a year later, she sold that and it helps, you know, it becomes a stepping stone in your career. So as an artist or, you know, doing comic books or something like that, or even a novelist, you know, you could write prose, you could do a comic book or something like that. And then you can release it on uh, Kickstarter. So hopefully it might bring you in a little bit of revenue, you know, with any luck, but also it's a project you now have a portfolio and you can show this to people and say, look what I'm capable of. Oh, and by the way, the project shipped, it's finished. So I prove that I can actually finish a project, which is sometimes even better than your drawing ability. Yeah, right. kind of kind of jumping off of that same idea. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Self-publishing is still published. Like you can 100% say, I am a published author, even if you self-published three books. You still published it. It's out. It's it's being sold. It's part of the market. Like it's it's a product that you created that you saw from start to finish, and you sent it out. So you can still do the exact same thing. And right now, with especially so many creatives staying at home, like what you're saying, this is this would be a time for you to sit down and do it. Well, that's great advice. Anything else that you guys talked about on the panel that you wanted to add? Wear a mask. Yes. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Your favorite heroes wear them. You could wear them too. Yes, I agree. They look so great. Thank, Thank you so too. much. <laughs> Thank you, Chris Morrow, Comic Con at home, um, remotely connected from the Tin Fish. Thank you all. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you so much. AC, Jess, it was great seeing you guys again. Did I see you yeah. again? Hopefully, we'll see, see you in person soon. Yeah. <laughs>